Okay, good, good afternoon everyone. Um, very welcome to this, this afternoon's um, committee meeting. We have we have quorum. In fact, we have everyone here, um, so we have no apologies. Um, I do remind members to maintain social distancing throughout the meeting. Madam Chair, um, I, I can hardly pick you up. Apologies. Maybe you might not want to hear me. Um, okay, so today's business, we will be receiving, we will consider some subordinate legislation and then the departmental briefing on Brexit. Unfortunately, we had to um, move um, the presentation from TransLink to another day, just due to um, obviously the restrictions on our time today. Um, just remind members that we do have to be out of this room by 1.30. Um, I have no business. Moving into draft minutes, page six, um, for the meeting of the 7th of October. Members content? Agreed. Um, matters arising at item four, page sixteen of your page fifteen of your packs, and again, those are the matters from the meeting of the seventh of October. Um, to members of any issues, obviously we had hoped to have a discussion in relation to the briefing that we received at last week's meeting, with regards to aspects of decarbonisation, which we may want to pursue as part of an inquiry. Just time limits us today, so if members are content that we'll look at that at a future meeting. Great. Okay. Are there any other issues that members wish to discuss as a consequence of last week's meeting? Okay, content. Okay, page 19, outstanding committee request for information. Just to note, moving then to correspondence at item, um, it's item five, and just draw your attention to correspondence at um, page 26, and also in table papers at page three. Um, at page 27, we have correspondence from Jonathan Hobbs, um, just in relation to the nature and the content of the consultation on the cycle routes amendment order in Northern Ireland 2020. Uh, are members content just to forward this on to the department for, for comment and obviously to consider um, the manner in which they um, carry out future consultations? Yeah, just Any other issues yeah. on that, Mr. Boylan? Yeah, Chair, this is the one about the, the, the uh, maps not being up on the, on the screen. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, yeah, certainly. Yeah. I think it's just something we need to highlight, to be honest with you. Okay, okay thank you. Um, at page um, 177, we have correspondence from Renewables NI regarding, obviously, their recent change of name and also a request to meet us. Um, if members are content, this may fall into some of the work that we may do with regards to... Um, any inquiry that we do, particularly around sort of the, the decarbonisation <coughs> aspects of it, so we, it may be useful for them to be scheduled in to come and do a briefing sure. um, in conjunction with that, if you're content to yeah. do that. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, page 186, we have the departmental response um, to committee correspondence regarding issues arising from the committee meeting on the 23rd of September. Um, so the, the issue that I picked up from that was um, in relation to the transfer of functions, and that's obviously progressed. Mm -hmm. We may wish to schedule a briefing from officials yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else anyone has picked up? I was going to schedule a briefing when we're doing the flooding and drainage all in one day. Okay. That, would, that would work well. Makes sense. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts on that at this stage? Okay. No. Thank you. Um, moving then to... It was tabled at page eight with the interim report from the examiner of statutory rules, um, Angela Kelly, and she's highlighting three SRs, um, SR 2020-196, which is Good Vehicles Testing <coughs> Amendment, SR 2020-197, the Motor Vehicle Testing Amendment Regulations, and SR 2020-205, the Motorways Traffic Amendment Number 2 Regulations. Um, obviously, we agreed these three statutory rules subject to the examiner's report. The examiner is now advised that she will not draw special attention of the Assembly to these SRs in the report. Um, actions are suggested in the correspondence memo, so if members are content <coughs> with that. Great. Okay, thank you. Moving then to um, item six, which is um, SL1. A20, the A26 Crankle Road uh, Central Reservation Balamina Stopping Up Order, Northern Ireland 2020. And this is at page um, 205. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The, the rule will stop up a gap in the central reservation of the A26 Crankle Road 
Ballymena dual carriageway. The stopping up has been requested to prevent road traffic collisions at this location. Other roads are available which provide alternative facilities for road traffic. Is there anything further that we need to do in relation to that? No. Okay. Um, the PSNI and Midden East Antrim Borough Council have been consulted and have no objection to the proposal. Following completion of the consultation process, no objections were received during the objection period. Are members content with the proposals um, for the statutory rule? Okay. Um, item 7, which is SL1, the Alexandra Square Lurgan <coughs> Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. And this is at page 209. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of former road at Alexandra Square Car Park in Lurgan. The abandonment has been initiated by the Department as the length of former road is now part of a car park which transferred to the local council in 2005. The area of former road will be abandoned retrospectively to regularise the situation on the ground. The Department is of the view that the road is not necessary and may be abandoned. PSNI and Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon Council have been consulted and have no objection to the proposal. Following completion of the consultation process, no objections were received during the objection period. Ms Kelly, this is in your area. Is there any issue that you see? No, happy. The Council obviously have uh, given their consent, so content. Thank you. Okay, members content. Thank you. Thank you. Moving then to item 8, which is the Mount Pleasant, uh, Town Hill Road, Port Glenone stopping up border, Northern Ireland 2020. That's at page 213. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will stop up the northern junction of Mount Pleasant, Port Glenone, with Town Hill Road. The stopping up has been requested by departmental officials to eliminate road traffic collisions at this location. The PSNI and Midden East Antrim Borough Council have been consulted and have no objection to the proposal. Following completion of the consultation process, no objections were received during the objection period. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. 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 Thank you. Moving then to item nine which is the departmental briefing on Brexit. The papers are at page 217 of your pack. Uh, just to remind you that Hansard will record the meeting. Um, this was the briefing which we had hoped to receive a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, unfortunately, um, the officials um, weren't able, we, we weren't able to, to bring you forward at that stage, so just due to time pressures. And, of course, now you've been moved today again. But... Um, we will welcome um, Linda McHugh, the, temp the Deputy Secretary of Resources, Governance and EU Group, Jackie Robinson, the Director of Gateways and EU Re Relations, Jim Sutherland, Head of Brexit Planning Team, and Graham Banks, EU Exit Legislation and Rail Safety Branch. You're all very welcome um, this afternoon. Um, Linda, if you'd like to make some opening remarks and members and then follow up with some questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair and Committee members, um, for the opportunity to provide an update on the Department's work in relation to EU exit. I'm pleased to be joined today, as you said, by, by um, some members of my EU exit team. And as we look towards the end of the transition period uh, in December, issues in relation to EU exit are moving at pace, and so today's discussion is timely. And I'd like to start by giving you an overview of the work that we've done to date and the key current issues for both the department and our stakeholders. And then we're happy to take any questions that you may have. So you'll be well aware that the UK-EU negotiations on the future relationship are still to conclude, with no agreement currently in place. So whilst transport discussions may not be the most contentious area of negotiation, we must recognise the importance of transport and connectivity to Northern Ireland and the potential implications of a non-negotiated outcome. EU exit will also have an impact on wider operations within DFI, including water, flood risk management and planning. This broad range of impacts has added to the complexity of ensuring operational readiness for the 1st of January 2021. That said, work has been continuing across a number of key policy areas for a number of years now to understand both the issues um, and to be as prepared as possible for whatever the outcome of the negotiations. 
Before and during the negotiations, officials have engaged with our Whitehall counterparts to ensure that issues of particular importance to the Department and to Northern Ireland as a whole are understood. And I want to touch on a few of those issues. So firstly, transport. In the briefing that you received, the importance of securing both cabotage and transiting rights was highlighted as being of particular significance to the Northern Ireland haulage industry and to cross-border transport service providers. Cabotage is the transport of goods or passengers between two places in the same country by a transport operator from another country. At present, both freight and bus operators can conduct cabotage operations within the EU. Given the shared land border with the EU and the high levels of operations conducted in the EU, in particular in Ireland, it is important to ensure that our hauliers and bus operators can continue to operate cabotage. The briefing note also highlighted the significance of transiting for both customs and for haulage. From a DFI perspective, we have a particular interest in relation to the mutual recognition of rail safety certificates, licenses and permits. <clears throat> At this stage, there are issues to be resolved in relation to the arrangements that will replace the EU community licence to transport goods by road to or through EU and EEA countries and recognition of a UK licence for the community is being discussed as part of the ongoing negotiations. The need for continued recognition of drivers' qualifications, such as the Drivers' Certificate of Professional Competence, or CPC, um, also finding a solution to the Transport Manager's CPC EU Member State residential requirement, and the need for European Conference of Ministers of Transport free reciprocal access to Ireland in the event of a non-negotiated outcome and in the absence of other alternative arrangements. In relation to water, the main risk identified for the water sector is the potential for disruption of the supply of critical chemicals required to treat drinking water and wastewater. To mitigate this risk, Northern Ireland Water has worked closely with its supply chain and the water sector, both across this island and in the UK. It's worked with all its suppliers to map and understand the supply chain to ensure that all risks are understood and contingencies are in place, including maximising stock levels of chemicals. Northern Ireland Water has maintained stock levels at these higher than normal levels for over a year now. Its contingency arrangements have been kept in place since then and were adapted to deal with the early stages of COVID lockdown. Indeed, the water sector as a whole has continued to monitor the chemical supply chain throughout the COVID crisis and continues to build on the work done last year in preparation for EU exit. Turning now to legislation, throughout the UK's membership of the EU, legislation for much of the department's remit transport, water and flooding in particular, has been derived from EU directives and regulations. Consequently, the Department's legislative remit has been heavily impacted by EU exit. The Department reviewed existing statute to develop an action plan to ensure its operability post-exit. This review examined 250 pieces of legislation and, it, and identified that around 50 uh, were required to fix 50 pieces of legislation were required to fix post-exit inoperables. The vast majority required minor technical amendments with little or no change in terms of the intent of relevant legislation or supporting policies. As of today, the Department has five remaining pieces of EU exit legislation to take through the Assembly. These statutory rules cover the public transport obligation, or how we fund TransLink, cross-border bus services, rail safety and cross-border rail services, port services and potentially land use planning. Broadly speaking, the purpose of these amendments is to correct inoperables in retained EU law, implement our commitments as a requirement of the Northern Ireland Protocol, implement the outcomes of the ongoing UK-EU negotiations and make minor technical amendments. In addition to the legislative programme outlined, a key issue for the Department is the repeal of the European Communities Act 1972 and its impact on the Department's regulating, regulation making powers across a range of policy areas, which have until recently been predominantly EU led. The Executive Office is leading on the development of an executive bill to provide departments with continued regulation making powers. 
A significant degree of engagement and consultation has taken place with UK government departments, other departments here, our ALBs, our stakeholders and the Departmental Solicitor's Office in the preparation and delivery of the department's EU exit legislative programme. Mm -hmm. Officials will continue with this level of engagement and consultation as legislation is prepared for community scrutiny, or sorry, for committee scrutiny. Throughout the transition period, the Department has delivered a significant programme of EU exit-related legislation to ensure it has a functioning statute book for the post-transition period. Despite the limited time remaining, the outstanding pieces of legislation will be brought forward to be brought forward are sufficiently advanced to ensure that the programme will be delivered by the end of the transition period. So in terms of stakeholder engagement, both our minister and officials have been in regular contact with key stakeholders in order to understand their issues and share information. Minister Mallon personally initiated a series of stakeholder discussions that proved to be very useful. And as we move towards the end of the year, these discussions, both formal and informal, will continue. In conclusion, I hope that that summary has provided you with an overview of the work undertaken to date, the programme of work between now and the end of the year, and has given you some clarity on the issues still to be addressed. And we're happy to take any questions you now have. Okay. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, <coughs> obviously, the committee is aware of the infrastructure omnibus bill. Is that the executive bill which you're referring to? And could you maybe just give us a little bit more detail in relation to that and then how that will be taken through and what that will mean essentially for infrastructure? Yes, so um, that is the bill that, that we're referring to. And the, the issue has come about because um, when you make regulations under EU directives, you're relying on the EU directive as the primary source of, of legislation under which you make the amendments. If we can't rely on the EU directives, we need to rely on some other piece of primary power to do that. So that's the bill that um, is currently being worked on. Jackie, do you want to maybe um, Yeah, it, just um, to chair, I think probably you referenced as well the fact that there was a bill that we thought was going to be an omnibus bill for this department. That was um, a, a, a point at which we thought that that was going to be the case. We now believe that TEO are going to take that forward and it will be one bill that covers all NICS departments. Um, so, so that's to be welcomed. Um, I think the provisions within it, um, a lot of them will come down to DFI, but the extent of that is still to be discussed. Okay. And then just in relation then to the five remaining SRs, the timing of those coming to the committee, can you give any indication of what that's likely to be? Yeah, I mean, a lot of them actually, some of them will depend on the outcome of the negotiations. Um, I think the, the final one, but Jackie, do you want to? Yeah, so we, we've got five. Um, we've got a public service obligations in transport, and we think that will probably come to the committee at your last meeting before Christmas. Um, and that is because of, um, of the fact that it will only be led as an SI um, at the beginning of December mm -hmm. in Westminster and will be subject to the Interbus Agreement, so unfortunately we're not going to be able to bring that forward any earlier. Um, there is a Railways Amendment one, which we're looking for clarity on on one point with our DSO colleagues at the moment, but I still hope to have it with you by early November. Um, the Port Services um, Amendment regulations, I hope to be here around about middle of November. And these are just indicative, just to, to give you an idea that we have as far as possible spaced them. And the land use planning, that, that's one, as Linda has mentioned, that we're currently looking for a bit of clarity around to, to see whether we actually need that. But if we do, it's likely to come again in November. But it shouldn't be too onerous in any specific week for the committee. Okay. I, um, I have a number of questions to ask, and I'm mindful that negotiations are still ongoing, and you may not be able to give me mm -hmm. um, full information in relation to that, and, and I'm guessing that'll be the same. For, for other members, so you know, if just so you know that we have an interest in those areas, and if you do have further information um, to to forward that on to us, even but in, in writing would be very very helpful. Um, one of the issues I want to look at would be state aid. Obviously, the um, new decade new approach states that the executive will benefit from increased funding for capital infrastructure investment as a result of the UK government's infrastructure revolution. And the projects obviously listed include York Street Interchange, A5, A6, and the medical school at McGee. How will the delivery of this commitment be affected 
by Northern Ireland remaining in the EU state aid regime. Mm -hmm. How will connectivity and competitiveness between the UK regions be affected by disparities in state aid regimes? And is there a risk that the protocol will prevent Northern Ireland being part of national initiatives to support business and strengthen transport links? Mm -hmm. I suppose the answer to that is we're, we're still unclear. Um, you know, we know that the UK is looking at um, a replacement for state aid legislation. We also know that state aid is mentioned in the protocol. What we're not sure about is how those two things are going to interlink and what the impact is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's anything further that we can tell you at this stage because it, it is unclear. Okay, and at this stage, um, do you know who would be responsible for submitting local state aid notifications? Um, to the EU after the 1st of January, is that still again unclear? Um, it's, it's unclear to me definitively, although I, it, it may go down to the economy, Department for Economy who may take that role on, but at this stage I wouldn't be sure. Okay. It's yeah. just whether or not then there would be any concerns in relation to disruption of projects. I mean, fr from a, a departmental perspective, um, I wouldn't have thought that state aid would, if it doesn't impact now, um, I doubt that it would impact once we leave in, in terms of our, our roads projects. Um, but, you know, as I said, until we get some clarification at the end of the negotiation process, um, we can't say definitively. Okay. The, um, turning into the common frameworks. Um, how would any future regulatory divergence between EU and Northern Ireland and obviously the rest of the United Kingdom impact on the viability of the common frameworks right across the United Kingdom and how will any risks of divergence be identified <coughs> and managed? Are you aware of the implications around that? So, so the purpose of the common frameworks is to actually help us manage divergence. <coughs> um, so I, I often refer to this as like a donut. Um, so w within the common frameworks will give us um, the, the areas where we cannot diverge, then there will be that bit on the outside where there is an element where we can diverge but still stay within the general rules and then obviously outside that where there, there can be no divergence because there may be an impact for example on free trade agreements. Um, so the purpose of the common frameworks is to allow that system to develop. Um, we have a number within the department that are going forward, a um, number of common frameworks, um, and I think as they start to roll out and we start to look at the implications going forward, that will become more clear. Um, you'll be aware that there's one common framework in relation to hazardous substances, which has already been cleared. Um, the rest, we will be engaging with the committee on the provisional common frameworks, and they relate to um, commercial transport, motor insurance, driving licences, intelligence transport systems and operator licences for road transport, as well as interoperability of the rail system. Um, the, the potential is that we will have provisional common frameworks in place by the end of the year, and we will look to more detailed frameworks <coughs> next year, um, but we will continue to engage with the committee as that process goes on. Okay, and, and as you're working through that, have you received any specific <coughs> instructions from the EU in, in terms of protocol ob obligations? Not from the EU. Um, you know, I think again, bec because the, the, the main relationship is actually between the EU and the UK government, mm -hmm. so the EU wouldn't tend to um, deal directly with, with us in the department. But I, I think in looking at the common frameworks, it's clearly important um, that. The needs of Northern Ireland are, are reflected in whatever common framework is established, um, particularly on things like transport, where you know we need to ensure that rail services can continue north-south. So it's not just keeping um, in, in line with east-west uh, standards. So you know that that is really our role to make sure that that whatever common frameworks are developed, our position is clear and and provided for in those frameworks. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair, and I know, I know members will have many questions across the whole gambit, but certainly I'm concentrating a couple here. Just uh, the ports, and currently the department has taken forward the harbour bill through. I've had some details on that. 
to accelerate a passage and I think it last updated in 1989. Just remind us again how much that will increase by and also what was it uh, seen that this loan would be used for provide infrastructure moving forward of the, of the nature? So the, the Ports <coughs> bill, um, as currently drafted, is to increase the limit from 35 million to 90 million. 90. 90. Um, and that's provision <coughs> for the department um, as an upper limit um, to, to provide for the ports to, um, for grants and loans to the ports to allow them to do infrastructure bills. In relation to the infrastructure that is required for post EU exit, specifically around SPS, mm -hmm. I just want to be very clear that I do not think at this stage that that bill or the, the limit within it will be used for any um, of that work. But it may be used where a port decides that they want to expand their business in a post EU world and they may come to us for a loan or a grant in relation to that. But that's very different from the actual infrastructure bills. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks. That clarifies a couple of questions as yeah. well. Then on, on on that part of the bill and, and moving forward, uh, I just that's sorry. a side issue. Just on on, on that as a the recovery of that money. How does that work? So, if it's a grant, the money isn't recovered. It is a grant. It is a grant. Yeah. If it is a loan, then uh, it, whenever that loan is being decided, there is work between the port authority and the department to look at the time limit over which that loan was repaid. And it just comes back in. Okay. Sorry, I, I, th I was just going to say it's important to remember that the 90 million limit is cumulative. So anything that a port borrows counts, and it, o over a number of years that will will clearly build up. Build so, up yeah. You know, it's not that suddenly they're going to get an extra um, what, 55 million <coughs> to spend in, mm -hmm. in a year. Mm -hmm. And it does go back to your loans point. So while, yeah. while those loans may be repaid, that doesn't come off. Mm -hmm. It, the total amount out, you know, that, that's been used. Okay, thank you. Uh, on, on the railways, then, how, if at all, will the legislation in GB differ from the framework in Northern Ireland from the first of January? On the railways, I'm going to pass over, I think, to Graham to answer that one as my yep. rail specialist. <laughs> um, how do you spell rail? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the the rules going forward post January first. Um, there will be. Uh, there, there will be no immediate divergence between the uh, national notified technical standards uh, for rail travel in the UK as compared to the, the rail safety regime in Northern Ireland. Um, the, the, the protocol, the Northern Ireland protocol, sets out that uh, Northern Ireland will continue to apply the technical standards for interoperability. That's the EU set standards. So. There is the potential in future where uh, the UK government and the Office for Road and Rail, as the rail regulator for GB, if they decide that uh, rail standards need to, to, to change in a particular way to suit the, the rail system in, in GB, then those, those standards may, may diverge from the European Union, which will apply here in Northern Ireland. But immediately on 1st of January, there will be no difference in the, the technical standards for interoperability. Okay, and the, the public service obligation, would that, does that fall under state aid regime or does that uh, sit separate? The, 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 public, the public service obligation is an exemption to the state aid regime, so that allows the department to, to, to fund TransLink. Um, the, that, that is in Annex 5 to, to Article 10 of the protocol, and that will continue to apply um, post transition period. Okay, and finally, is there any prospect of commuters in uh, Great Britain being able to benefit? From greater concessions than those required to be offered to Northern Ireland. Oh. It w again, that will depend specifically on the, the, the concessionary fare schemes that, that, that will apply. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of the particular of the schemes in, in, in GB, but yeah. it will be within the, the, the power of the Assembly and the Minister to to make amendments to the scheme here in Northern Ireland if they want to vary that. Yeah, so we have uh, to seek parity then, just their own. No, the, 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 the minister has power already to to vary those schemes within um, 1370 uh, and the public service obligation. Those can be varied, and the concessionary uh, fare schemes can be can be varied as a result. So it, it, it will be within the gift of 
uh, the Minister here to, to, to make those amendments, if, if that's what she wishes. Okay, that's fine. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Linda and Jackie and Jim and Graham. The Jackie's all too jumping in for me. <laughs> Uh, just on the, the whole uh, cabotage and transit stuff Linda you referred to, how advanced are those talks? And you know, at the moment, we're, we're obviously coming near to the end of December. How advanced are those talks? Getting recognition for that? Mm -hmm. Again, it's part of the EU-UK negotiations, which we're not party to. Um, so we're waiting with bated breath for the outcome of that, so that we can then make um, any arrangements that we need to as a result of the outcome of the negotiations, whether it's. Um, uh, a negotiated outcome or not, um, but I think if, it's, if, it, if there is no negotiated outcome, it will be very difficult. I think for both hauliers and indeed Translink to operate cabotage, if not impossible. Jackie, you referred to. I just didn't hear you properly regarding to um, CPC modules or you know drivers' qualifications, etc. Where do we see that at the end of December? Do, do we see them transferring across? So again, that's still within the negotiation um, stage. So it, it, it would be difficult at this. It would be impossible for me at this stage to say what's going to happen on the first of January. Okay. Uh, I want to move on into water and chemicals. Mm -hmm. I think there's a piece in your paper regarding chemical supply. Do we know what percentage of water chemicals that's for water treatment or sewage treatment are coming through Europe, or, or are they manufactured in GB? Are there any percentage figures in that? Mm -hmm. It varies greatly depending on, on the type of chemical. So some come directly from Europe, some are produced in either GB or NI, and some are produced in Ireland. Um, I suppose Northern Ireland Water has done a huge amount of work to understand not only where its chemicals come from, but where its chemical suppliers get their raw materials from. So we've got a really good understanding of, of the supply chain. Um, and they've also really importantly worked um, across the water sector as a whole. Um, so the water sector in the UK has again done a massive amount of work on this um, and I think one thing that actually is to their advantage is that even those chemicals that come from Europe through GB don't tend to use the short straits so the sort of Dover Calais type routes where um, at the end of the transition period that's where they think most of the um, delays might occur they tend to come through the ports on the eastern seaboard so places like Immingham um, where it, it's, it's anticipated that there's going to be less, less problem. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, Northern Water has been looking at you know, not only at the routes that its current suppliers take, but are there any alternatives, um, are there any plan Bs? And they've also, as I said, um, built up uh, a big reserve of chemicals. Um, now, clearly, some of the chemicals are volatile, so there is a lot to how many weeks worth you can keep in any one time, in any one place. But typically, they've got about seven weeks supply, so that if they do hit any issues early on, um, they can be resolved, um, and they've, they've still got that supply. Um, the, the sector in the UK is also um, working on a mutual aid um, scheme, so that if you know one uh, company runs out, um, they can seek help um, in terms of supplies from another that might have more of a supply than they do. Um, Sorry, does, does any of what are then do they do a just in time principle of storage or do they store for a maximum of the shelf life? No, as I say, that they've, they've, they've got about seven weeks supply of all seven. their seven um, of all their chemicals. Um, either they do or their supplier who's based in Northern Ireland does on their behalf and they're, they're holding it rather than Northern Water. So is any water purchasing all their chemicals <coughs> through an NA supplier or are they purchasing some further afield? No, it's it's a real mix. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. Um, change position for today. Uh, Linda, j just slightly worrying there in response to the cabotage question because, mm -hmm. I mean, if we're not going to adapt what's, what's come from Europe and we're going to bring, England's going to bring in their new laws, well, I mean, it's going to clearly leave our hauliers at a disadvantage and we need, we need to be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. And we have a statute, you know, statutory duty to, to protect those. So, I mean, I'm slightly concerned about that one, and we need to be. I, I understand the issue of deal or no deal. It's not a Nola Edmonds thing. It's, it's a very important thing. So we need to be very, very careful um, to protect the rights and to protect those jobs and and those opportunities. Mm -hmm. But a couple of my main questions is um, in terms of COVID, how has COVID affected the Brexit preparations? Mm -hmm. uh, in relation to the biggest challenge you see, uh, Brexit, 
what do you consider the department's biggest challenge? And also in uh, your prior priority work with DERA. I know DERA has the certain things in terms of um, screening of animals, food products and all that, those things at the mm -hmm. ports. Mm -hmm. In terms of your preparation and your working in, in tandem with them, uh, they're saying that you know their readiness programme and the SPS may not be. They, they may be falling short. So would you just like to comment on those three points, please? Okay. Um, well, in terms of COVID, I suppose the first thing to say is that it hasn't helped. Um, you know, and I think, um, to be fair to, to both the, the, the transport sector and, and to water, um, the work that was done last year to prepare for the first EU exit, so this time last year, stood us in very good stead when we went into emergency mode for COVID. Um, and as I said, you know, certainly in the, on the water sector, um, all of that understanding of, of where the pinch points were in, in the um, supply chain and, and mitigating against that stood them in good stead. And um, throughout the COVID crisis, they have continued to, um, to respond to that um, and, and to, to, to understand if there's any problems um, arising out of, co out of COVID. And that has been monitored across the whole of the water sector. Um, but I think... It certainly, um, in, in terms of emergency planning, I mean, we are looking ahead to you know, what happens if we're in, in, the, in the jaws of a, a major second wave and we've got EU exit to deal with. Um, and how do we deal with those concurrent potential um, you know, emergency situations? So you're quite right to raise it. It certainly hasn't helped the position. But you know, we're, we're trying to mitigate the risks as much as possible of, of both COVID and any impact that comes from the EU exit. Um, I don't know. I, I'm going to ask Jackie in a minute what she thinks her biggest challenge is, because she's been working on this a lot longer than I have. But I think, to be honest, the biggest challenge is to, to, to understand the impact of whatever negotiation is, is um, forthcoming, um, whether it's a negotiated deal or not. And, and I think at the moment our biggest challenge is not knowing, quite frankly. Um, but maybe you want to. Yeah, as, as I would agree with Linda. I think trying to get to grips with what any negotiated outcome may look like is probably the biggest challenge. I think how that works with the protocol is another big challenge for us. But from a specific DFI point of view, I think my my biggest concern is probably around Holliers mm. and how that's going to work um, in a post Brexit. Um, situation. And, and just the issue that working with DERA and the challenge they may face on yourselves uh, around so, the ports. So, yeah, take, take your point, and I don't want to go into answering on behalf of DERA. Mm. Um, so, so t taking that into account, I suppose my concern around that is the impact on infrastructure not being available, the impact that that will have on our ports and their future viability. So no matter what the delay is going to be, there will be an impact on our ports. And obviously we have responsibility, especially for our trust ports. So that's where my big concern would be. And just finally, Chair, and I'm sorry I have to go off this because I made another arrangement, but just Jackie, because you've been dealing with the, the European stuff in particular, um, over the last number of years there has been a lot of good legislation that has come through Europe, as we have adopted both environmentally and, and through some of the road safety stuff, uh, in your opinion, and what you're saying. Um, we we probably would like to keep that adapted. And what you're saying with what's coming through now, uh, do you feel we can still retain some of those good measures we've done in the past? Um, I'm a, an official in the NIC. Um, officials advise, ministers decide, and it will be up to ministers to make any decision in relation to retaining any by way of. And it's up yeah. this committee to scrutinise that role. But thank you very well, much. What I, what I can say, though, is that from the 1st of January, we've done everything that we can um, to make sure that the current um, standards will will move forward. So, you know, that, I think that's what the focus of a lot of the adaptations and, and, and the um, the changes to legislation to make sure that, that what we've currently got is operable um, post exit. That we're we're sudden, not suddenly left with legislation that we can't implement. So. That's been the real focus. It's, it's not to sort of change or adapt or, or lessen. It's to, to maintain the standards that we've always 
Paul? No, and I appreciate it, and I'll just I'll finish off on this point, because I appreciate what Jackie said in terms of NCAS, but yeah. the issue is, even down as far as the, the likes of child car seats and regulations that come in through Europe, which you know most of us <coughs> would support, that's the kind of detail in some of the stuff, and I, I wouldn't see any problem or any of the committee see that those measures should be still retained. That's all. I asked it in that context, and there's a number of other things we've done in terms of regulations and directives down to the years. But I'll, I'll not ask you to answer that. But thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Yeah, th thanks for your presentation. Um, I want to focus on, on a section on haulage and cross border transport services. And in it, you highlight two areas of immediate interest that require high level of, levels of attention. Capitage, has been mentioned, and the transiting lights. And I agree that those are important uh, areas to be resolved so that they're not underutilised for our hauliers. But my, my question is, um, would you not agree it's even more significant risks that may need uh, even more urgent intervention at the highest level is our east-west movements, given the fact that much more of our goods move east-west, um, which could affect our hauliers, our distribution of goods, and even foods on our supermarkets. And I don't know if any of you were watching Spotlight last night, where the Northern Retail <coughs> Consortium were expressing alarm. The Federation of, of um, the Food, is it, what is it? The Federation, the Food and, and Drinks Federation, were uh, highlighting their concerns about the systems not being in place, and that many suppliers might well find that they're out about this new uh, RIC border when their lorries arrive at Carn Ryan. Uh, and we could then have also huge costs associated with getting food onto our supermarkets, veterinary inspections for pizzas to be able to, to, to uh, advise where all the components come to. So my, my question, sorry, and also even online distributors who most of their goods, we may not realise it, but most of our online purchases are coming from GB websites and the goods get brought in here for distribution and that will gum them up as well. But my question is, why do you not highlight uh, that the fact that there's a need for immediate interest at the highest level in terms of our east-west haulage and distribution. I think that's all wrapped up in the protocol. And we have clearly said that it's imperative that we understand the implications and the impacts of the Northern Ireland Protocol on that, that east-west movement. But in your briefing, you haven't highlighted all of this? It's probably something where, you know, so for example, the, the situation, and, and I'm going to, um, so if you're thinking about like Amazon deliveries, which is, is where you're talking about a lot of the, you know, that sort of thing, um, Department of Economy are leading on that um, in relation to the SPS checks of borders, obviously Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs are leading on that. So in our briefing, I think we were trying to stay within our ambit. Um, as Department of in Infrastructure officials, and that's maybe why it wasn't touched on in the briefing. But do you, under do you understand that everybody needs to be talking together, and everybody needs to fully understand the implications that are coming? Everyone has thought of the problems mm -hmm. in terms of cross-border, but there's been very little understandings of the problems that are coming, mm -hmm. literally, which could hit our supermarket shelves unless a reasonable accommodation uh, is made for distribution east-west. And just to, just to be to be very clear, while we didn't cover it in our briefing for you today, for the reasons that I've already stated, um, we would be in very close contact with um, officials in all other government departments, and we are working and we are aware of those issues. Um, but it's it's just you know trying to keep within the confines of of this um, committee. I, I don't fully understand. Surely, in terms of hauliers or hauliers will be gummed up at ports unless there's good arrangements put in place early and ones which are a light touch and therefore the whole distribution system will fall apart and everything else will fall apart. So yeah, so in, in relation particularly to freight and that east-west movement, um, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that the UK government put in place a contract in relation to short straits um, ferry capacity yesterday. Um, Sorry, so, can you elaborate please? So, so they put in place um, contracts with a number of providers um, which will cover the short straits um, areas. That's to ensure provision of goods, especially those critical goods and medicines, into the UK. Um, we have been looking for some time at capacity on the short straits ferry or, or on our Northern Ireland 
ferry routes. And at the moment, our estimate is that capacity is sufficient. Um, now, there is a bit of an issue around where capacity, if, if you think about overall what our capacity is on those ferries, it's probably sufficient. Whether there is sufficient capacity on certain ferries, um, especially for the, the ones that are used for just-in-time deliveries, there is maybe a question mark over that. We're also looking at what the potential for displacement of um, ferry routes would be. So people who normally use, say, Hollyhead to Dublin routes, will they change and start to use the, the Belfast Scotland routes and what the implications are? So that's, that's a work in progress. We're continuing to monitor that situation. Um, we have been talking to Department for Transport in London, and if we do become concerned about it, then we can go back to them and ask for a specific <coughs> contract in relation to those Irish Sea routes. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm, I'm aware that there, there certainly there is capacity on, on the route, but it's the uh, coming up of the ports is my greatest concern because of bureaucracy and documentation, which may be uh, have to be checked and goods having to be checked. Would you not accept that that's the greatest risk uh, at the moment? Yeah, I, I would. Ex I would accept that it's a it's a very significant risk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, your presentation and both being here today and for the information we received and just following on from the questions that were raised to you. Um, it's obvious that uh, maybe people didn't realise what they were voting for when they voted for Brexit, but there's there's unfortunately. Um, there's consequences of, uh, of us being dragged out of the EU, and it's those that I wouldn't mind uh, delving into with you around the preparedness planning that you speak about in the document, and remaining alert to the possibility of the new found phrase of non-negotiated outcome, I call a crash, and being having to pick ourselves out of the rubble. So when you talk about cabotage, uh, could you elaborate on what is meant by it's going to be very difficult if there's a crash out at the end of this year, if there's no a negotiated outcome? I'm assuming you've done some scoping so that we could have, in order to assist us with, um, with our role of scrutiny, that we can have information as to the implications of what that would be like. Do you want me to start with preparedness planning? Um, All right, okay, yeah. So, so the preparedness planning, we, we are as a department um, obviously preparing. Um, we're starting to put in place arrangements and starting to think about what may happen in the event of a non-negotiated outcome. Um, and we will put those in place, as Linda has already said, with the added complication of COVID um, and the potential to need to ramp up our contingency and our emergency planning measures in relation to that. It does become a very difficult space, but we are doing what we can. But see, with regards to the scoping up out of what may happen, you know, we've been facing this possibility of a crash out since we were dragged out. So what work has been done that can be shared with the members of this committee to allow us to scrutinise that about the implications of what this crash may look like? For, for instance, cabotage, when we think about um, the number of trucks and others that would be working, whether it is across the border or whether it is east-west. Okay. So, in relation to um, cabotage, if we start off with public transport, because obviously there's a cabotage element there, we do have a contingency arrangement in place, and that relates to the interbus agreement. So on the 1st of January, if, there's no non if there is no negotiated outcome, all current community licences and authorisations will fall, um, and the UK will accede to the interbus arrangement. Um, and will that be immediate when they fall from the 1st of January? So we, we hope so. So the, the protocol for the interbus covers regular and special um, services, i.e. scheduled services. Um, it has been negotiated between its contracting partners, but it has not yet been ratified. So we're still waiting for the ratification of that. So there um, could be some kind of a gap between the 1st of January, when the current arrangements fall, and then these new arrangements come in, and then what are the implications for those arrangements? Just here, I think we need to know that, so, because people will come and ask us. 
Yeah. Uh, we will be lobbied and we need to be shown A, that we have the information and B, that we're interrogating them. Yeah, so I mean, on, on that specific bus point, um, there is a potential risk that if the interbus agreement is not, if, if there's an extension, there needs to be an extension to it to allow cabotage. And if that isn't signed up to by three member states by the end of the year, then, for example, TransLink wouldn't be able to pick somebody up in Cavan and take them to Dundalk or wherever. Um, so that's quite significant, and that's information yeah. care that we would need, and that Joe and Jane public will need. People will be alarmed to discover, because in three months' time, given that we're coming so close to potentially going over a cliff, and there may not be such an agreement in place, so by the 1st of January, on top of everything else that people are dealing with, that they may have a situation where, for instance, TransLink cannot pick up people and take them from one destination to another. And you know, that's why the Interbus Agreement and its extension is really important um, and why we're doing everything we can to press that that is agreed and ratified in time. Okay, well, I'll, I'll leave that with the Chair because I think that would be something we would want to come back to and get more information on and go forward. Could I ask just in relation to water, the purification of water, and we know that seven weeks is not a long time and we know the chemicals are dangerous. What's been the scope and out of the cost for MNA water in the event of a no deal? Because when they were in front of the committee, mm -hmm. they had told us that in the event of a no yeah. deal, that the cost of these chemicals would go up. Yeah. And do we have information about that, what that would be? No, and actually, I think it's very difficult to make an estimate at this point because, and again, it's back to you know what is the implication of, of the Northern Ireland Protocol? Will it delay? or add cost to the transportation of chemicals from GB and, and to Northern Ireland. Um, you know, what would the impact be on the chemical supplies that it gets from Ireland? Um, and so none of that is actually known. But if yet. we have a supply chain coming from Ireland for those, pro for those chemicals that come from the EU, if the protocol is not uh, damaged anyway by this internal market bill, which we know it will be, um, then it's the, 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 the transportation of that in here and the cost to NA yeah. water. Yeah, and, and actually some of the chemicals themselves are produced in Ireland itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so until we know exactly um, what new, um, new methodology and paperwork is required, it's actually not, it, it's nearly impossible to estimate an additional cost. So there can be no planning or preparing or scoping out of what that would be in the event, say, for instance, of a crash out in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Well, they are, they are clearly looking at it, um, and they are trying to get their heads around exactly what new um, paperwork is needed. But until the negotiated outcome or or the end of the, the negotiations, so the first of January, really, they would have to be looking at this. Yeah. And can it be done in the seven weeks? Given that's all the water that they, uh, the chemicals that they have for the purification of our drinking water. Yeah, I mean I that's all they would have to in their stock. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that this is going to mean that there will be no chemicals getting into Northern Ireland water. Um, I think we are estimating or expecting that the cost... The cost of, of it, no, that's what I'm trying to get at The cost of it will rise, but, of but it's not going to be that there's, there's going to be no chemicals. No, but it's the cost of those chemicals, because mm -hmm. NI water is uh, struggling as it is mm -hmm. in terms it of the, um, the financial package that it's trying to deliver. Yeah. Uh, sewage and everything else. Yeah. So this is going to be an additional cost, and we we would need to know that. Yeah. And so much relies on what the what the negotiated outcome or not on not or non negotiated outcome means in terms of the transportation. Well, of, I think that's something we should go back to chair and just in terms of forecasts. And finally, last question in relation to stakeholders. You mentioned key stakeholders meetings. Uh, wouldn't mind getting some information as to uh, you said this was across the departmental remit during August and September. Those meetings took place, and obviously I'm concerned for Holliers. It has been mentioned uh, because they have huge huge concern what's going to happen on the 31st of December. So can we? Can we get information as to who was at those meetings? It, th those meetings were arranged. We had a first series of meetings um, way earlier on in the year um, that were face to face with the minister. They had to be um, ended abruptly because of COVID restrictions, and they were rearranged then in August, September. Um, I think I'm right in saying the last one was actually with Northern Ireland Water yesterday. But I'll maybe pass over to Jim for a bit more detail in relation to the numbers of the, the membership of those engagement sessions. Truly, yeah. Uh, the stakeholder meetings themselves were 
organised on a sectoral basis. Uh, we talked to uh, the road transport uh, stakeholders as a group. That included discussions with Freight Trade Association and the Road Holiday Association. They, they, they took part within that. We had separate discussions with the ports and all of the Northern Ireland ports were involved in, in those discussions. Similarly, we had uh, discussions with the airports and uh, we've also had discussions with the uh, consumer uh, related issues. Uh, so we've had a wide range of, of, of conversations that have been reasonably well attended. We've had, I can't remember the participants off the top of my head, but I know from, from being at the meetings that they were, they were very useful, they were informative for us. Uh, there were messages that came out consistently across all the sectoral groups. A lot of that related to uh, the absence of clarity on some issues, the uh, timescales that set, uh, stakeholders were up against in terms of, of preparing for uh, the post-EU environment. So those kind of issues have, yeah. have, have come to the fore. Uh, on more than one occasion. Okay, Jim, thanks for that. I think it would be helpful, Chair, if we could get a list of the attendees of those stakeholders' meetings so we know who, were, who was all in attendance and maybe a readout, like yeah. you're just giving us now, of those meetings where possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Thanks, Chair. I'll be brief. It was my question been answered. But just uh, uh, during the course of the questions and, and briefing, uh, and now, uh, it does seem to me there's a collective. Um, um, organisational response required in, in light of Brexit preparations you know, from the economy, infrastructure and I think you mentioned one other. I just want some reassurance that whilst each department is you know, looking to themselves and the impact of Brexit, that there is collegiate working across various departments. Oh, no, there definitely is. Um, you know, we've all been involved at various levels um, in terms of both um, uh, input into the legislative programme um, understanding how um, we all inter interact and, and then looking at the mitigations and making sure that we're all, all working as one. And there's, there's been a very high degree of interdepartmental work, um, both, I mean, going back a number of years, actually, um, and that is continuing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. And similar to Mrs. Kelly, a lot of my queries have been answered. Um, very comprehensive briefing, and obviously I had read through it before when you were meant to be here. Uh, Our business didn't permit you. Uh, just one thing, just in terms of the infrastructure omnibus bill, there's been some discussions around that. I don't think it's referenced in these papers, but it's been referenced in other papers. Um, there's a very small time scale now to get legislation through before the end of this calendar year. It's, you know, the time is really not on our side. Is there any idea when that's going to be tabled and will it be done through accelerated passage or will it be given proper scrutiny through a proper legislative programme? I'll maybe take yeah. that. So, um, so whenever we put down a marker, and it was just a marker for an omnibus bill, we weren't sure how the department as a whole was going to manage the absence of two two powers coming from the European community. Um, since that time, we have now got clarity and TEO are going to take forward a single bill which will encompass the issues across all departments. Okay. Um, so while it was right at, th at that point in time, I would still maintain to put that marker down. We now no longer need that bill. But just in relation to your point about accelerated passage and the need for it, um, that bill does not have to come in on the 1st of January. Okay. That will be powers that we will use at stages going forward as there's potential for divergence or as we want to make changes in the legislation. Um, so I wouldn't be overly concerned about the 1st of January. I think what we have been doing is to focus on the stuff which we need it to do in relation to legislation to make sure that we had a functioning statute book. Yeah. And that's something that the, the bill itself will be something that will come in next year. Thank you very much. Just one point, I just want to thank the officials for the work that's being done. There's a significant amount of work being done either through Northern Ireland Civil Service or from arms length bodies or harbours or ports and all the rest of it. And I do appreciate this. All of this is the outworkings of Brexit, and you know the protocol is not an ideal situation, but it's the implications of Brexit. So we're dealing with the consequences of that. 
Northern Ireland voted to remain. We were voted to remain within the European Union, and we're dealing with the consequences of that. So I do appreciate the work that's being done. That some of you are making. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks for for the briefing. And apologies if I cover anything because my phone's hopping here. The, the, I'm sure everybody <laughs> is <so> trying to <laughs> trying to, to keep focused here. But obviously, with with the announcements this morning, there's there's quite a lot happening. Um, a number of the points I was going to raise have been covered as well. Mm-hmm. One yeah. of the things. Um, that I suppose leading on from my colleague uh, Martin Anderson's uh, thing and around um, Jackie's response about the interbus um, arrangement. I'd met with some of the haulage sector um, the last number of months and the most re- re- recent meeting this week. So there are obviously still a lot, a lot of issues need clarified there. Um, one of the things that, that we discussed was that if arrangements are finally agreed on, mm-hmm. how long will this take um, to adopt and, and put them in place? Um, such as the arrangements to replace the EU community licence to transport goods. Like one of the one of the things they said was they understood about the, the, the movement of goods, but what that will mean for how they're being moved as in like the road hauliers, things like that. Um, so <laughs> if you can, if you can. I, um, yeah, it, it will be put in place as soon as we know what the outcome of the negotiations are. Anything that needs to be put in place is the outworking of that as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, where that requires legislation, um, we will need to come back obviously to the committee, um, but we will do it in as good time as we can. But, but we're, we are so, working as best we can to, to mitigate any issues. Yeah, I suppose it's that uncertainty as well. Yeah. Um, I suppose in relation to that as well around um, drivers' qualifications, because obviously that's a, a concern. Is there work has work going on towards, you know, continuing that recognition of, the, of drivers' qualifications? Um, for example, the driver certificate of professional competence, that type of thing. Again, that's still in the negotiations. Still, phase. That's still all part of it. We would have liked to have had mutual recognition, but that that not to the stage at least proof of. Yeah, that was just the only two, and most of the other things I had were already. But you're right. I mean, if you think about a lorry with goods, you know, there's can the goods get across? What about the vehicle? Yeah. And what about the driver? Well, that 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 you know, I and, met and with them, yeah, some you of have them to yesterday. get all of those three lined up before yeah. something can, can actually cross a border now. So yeah, so and it is a huge concern, and and I suppose with COVID, a lot of we, we've talked about this at length before. A lot of hauliers are impacted in different ways. So some are are, are doing better than and others are completely decimated because of essential goods and non-essential goods and all of that. And for those that have been poorly um, or been badly affected, they've now got Brexit coming down the line. Mm-hmm. Like one of them has said to me that this period now between October and Christmas is their quiet period, so they haven't even had a chance to recover from mm-hmm. l- the loss of, of business from COVID. They're now into this and then Brexit is hitting them straight in the face. So it's, it's, it's difficultly compounded. It's backloads as well. So, it, yeah. so if they have all the licences and the necessary stuff to, to get the load that they're taking out, but they rely for their profitability on the backload that they're yeah. getting to come back in again. So, yeah. yeah, well, they're saying at the minute they're running empty lo- empty tra- trucks to mm-hmm. pick up loads to take back, which is a, is a cost. It's technically hemorrhaging money, I suppose. But no, that's grand. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Any members, any further questions to ask at this stage? No, content. Thank you. Thank you very much um, you. for your briefing. Um, obviously, there's a bit of information that um, is required following on from um, from questions, um, and committee staff will review the recording Fine. and write to you. So, thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you again. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Members content then that um, the committee staff review the recording and there's a number of points which additional information was required. Okay, thank you. Moving then to our forward work programme, uh, just draw your attention to that at page 244. Uh, this is the proposed um, programme until, until the 11th of November, so are members content? Okay, thank you. Any other bit? Right. Declaring an interest previously employee of Translink, but we'll reschedule the Translink briefing as part of that. We, we plan program. to do that. Yeah, yeah. I think Chris had, Chris had intended to come through Starleaf, yes. so we, I mean, we might be able to do that. Um, we'll filling it in. Um, we may have to take account of what was said there about the legislative process, yes. some of the common frameworks and others that may be coming before us. Well, I'm guessing that will probably come 
post the 11th of November anyway, so okay. there'll be an opportunity then to. Um, we are moving the departmental briefing on the strategic drainage investment strategy to the 18th of November because they haven't got it cleared yet by the minister to go out for consultation. Okay. And if memory serves me right, I think we're putting in DVA briefing for that okay. day. Who? DVA. DVA. Yeah. There's a new chief executive, uh, Jeremy Logan. Yes, he was the acting. Yes. He's yeah. got it now. Okay. okay, and just obviously in relation to the point around DVA, um, there was some conversation in relation to how today's announcements will impact on yeah. um, DVA services, mm -hmm. including driving tests. So it might be useful if we could get an, an early um, response from the department rather yeah. than waiting the normal two weeks. If we could get something fairly quickly from them, it would be very helpful. I think that would be very useful, Chair, because yeah, queries are already coming in. You know. Okay. Uh, members, anything else to raise at this point? Sure. Just one point, and it kind of leads on from what I raised there regarding the, the hauliers. Obviously, um, we had the motion that went through the Assembly in relation to the taxis, the coach operators and, and the hauliers. Um, and I know the Minister has initiated um, work on that in terms of a financial package. So it was really to see could we write to the Minister to get an update on where that's at. Um, I'm just, because of what's happening today, I'm, I'm even more... Uh, aware of, of those people that haven't got any support yet, and, and we're now leaving it. We're now moving into another situation. So, um, I know I know she has been engaging with with, um, for example, the Road Haulage Association there. So, um, if we could get an update, and that would be very good. It would be useful. Although I suppose last week we had indicative figures from um, coach operators and taxis, but not from the hauliers. Yeah. So, um, there's still obviously some work that needs to be. I thought the I thought the the coach one was coach and hauliers. My recollection of that, I, I, I said coach I, I, I thought just well, we can get one point three we'll get, we'll get some clarification yeah. in relation yeah. Yeah. to just so at least we can say to people when they can expect to hear or what 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 we're talking about here because. I suppose they're conscious too that it could be that it's not they don't want to be very onerous either because they've already waited so long. Mm -hmm. no? Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, any other issues at the stage? Okay, thank you. So just advise you obviously to maintain social distancing as you leave the room and to take all your belongings with you. Um, next week we will be meeting at 9.30 for a, a workshop and then our formal meeting will then take place at 10.30 in the Senate Chamber. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed.